Happy New Year, and welcome to the first episode of the new series of the Haiku P podcast. It's such a relief to have a new year in front of us, isn't it? And I hope to goodness this year is an improvement on last year. Don't you? I'm Patricia, and a few years back, I started the Haiku P podcast to learn about haiku, its history, its structure, how to write and read them, And now I'm happy that so many of you have joined me along the way. This year I hope I can improve the podcast and all our other haiku offerings, but I'm going to need help. For example, I'm running out of video haiku for the Poetry P YouTube channel, so please, if you're out and about and see something that takes your fancy, record a 20 second video in landscape mode Create one of your wonderful haiku to go with it, and send them to me. The easiest way is to use Google Drive, but you can always ask me if you're having problems. I think I already told you that due to popular demand, the print and Kindle journal will be continuing this year. My husband has been press ganged into helping with the word processing, and some of you have volunteered to do editing, for which I am truly grateful. I will need more volunteers to be community judges, so if you fancy doing that, let me know. What I'm looking for is a small panel of people per topic to have a Zoom chat and analyse the haiku or senryu that have caught their imagination. And then the panel will choose a winning verse. Now I really can only achieve that with volunteers, So do please let me know if you'd be willing to be on a Zoom chat and have that chat included in the podcast. Don't forget, we're still writing Renku. I'll read you some of the latest one today. But if you fancy having a go and writing in collaboration with other poets, let me know and I'll include you in one of the Renkus we do this year. Email me if you're interested. Now, of course, I will continue the writing topics. They're up on the website. Currently, I'm accepting haiku and senryu with humour until the 20th of January. And then in February, we're writing haiku and senryu with exaggerated perspective. Now, if you haven't got a clue what I mean, you needn't worry, as in today's podcast, Deborah P. Kolodji is coming along to give us some examples. And you can see that chat uncut on our YouTube channel. And of course, you'll be able to read her slides too. I'd like to make improvements to the journal this year. I'm thinking perhaps adding essays and maybe some high bun. So if you have something you'd like to submit, please send them to me via email. If you're writing an essay, it should be no longer than 1500 words. But of course, if you have any questions, you know how to get hold of me. And if you don't, then... Just go to the Poetry Bee website and you'll find my contact details. So today we have a chat with Deborah P. Kolodji on exaggerated perspective. There's the Renku and a project that you might be interested in joining. Jim Force will be telling us a little bit about that. And because it's traditional for the first episode of the new year, I bring you a non-haiku poem to enjoy. I know you were promised an analysis of Kelly Sauvage Angel's haiku Two Moons in our last podcast. Thank you to everyone who sent me their thoughts. I was hoping that I'd have a response back from Kelly about her poem, but to be honest, I didn't give her enough time, so I'll hold that over for another month and see if I get her response. Before we kick off today, I want to thank Nadja Kostadinova for a lovely present She told me that she'd written a haiku about the podcast and it was published in The Bamboo Hut, Issue 2, 2020. Drifting into Meditation, Haiku Podcast Drifting into Meditation, Haiku Podcast Cheers, Nadia. I was really touched. And then, the following day, Richard Hargreave sent me this via Twitter. Wrapping presents, listening to the P podcast, trying not to rustle. 
Wrapping Presents, Listening to the P Podcast, Trying Not to Rustle. Thank you, Richard. Honestly, my cup truly runneth over. So, let's start with this year's non-haiku poem. If you're on the mailing list, you'll have received an email from me last year about imagism. If you're not on the list and you'd like to be on it, there's a sign-up on the website. Anyway, I'm currently doing some research into imagism and its influence on haiku. I have to thank you very much for sending me so much reading material and for entering into my discussions. Wayne Kingston, who instigated the project, wonders if we may have awoken a dragon. Anyway, there'll be more about this project in a future podcast. Craig Kittner emailed me and introduced me to a new poet, who I'm really enjoying, and I wanted to read part of one of his poems to you. The poet is F.S. Flint. He seems to have been one of the lesser known of the original imagists. And the poem I want to bring to you is Ogre. I'll just read the first verse. You can read more by following the link in the show notes. Through the open window can be seen the poplars at the end of the garden, shaking in the wind, a wall of green leaves so high that the sky is shut off. I found inspiration in the poem to write a few haiku. An open window, poplars at the end of the garden, shaking in the wind. Poplars in the garden, a high wall of green leaves, shutting off the sky. The open window frames a wall of green leaves and the sky. I hope you have a read through the whole poem and see if it inspires you to write haiku. Perhaps you can send them to me via email and I'll select them for the spring edition of the journal 2021. Now, as I said, I've published some of the topics for this year on the website and the second topic, or technique, is exaggerated perspective in haiku. I saw Deborah P. Kologi speak about this at the Haiku Society of America Zoom conference and was really excited. So much so that I chose it as a technique for this year and invited Deborah to give a shortened version of her talk, especially for us. There's a bit of interference on the audio towards the end, but you can find the talk on Poetry P's YouTube channel in its uncut version, where you can read the poems and discover who the wonderful poets are. Let's have a listen to Debbie. I'd like to introduce Deborah P. Kalodji to you. Well, actually, many of you will already know her. If you listen regularly to the podcast, you will have heard me read many of her pieces of haiku. But in case you don't, Deborah is the California Regional Coordinator for the Haiku Society of America, and she's on the board of Haiku North America. Debbie has published over a thousand haiku, and her first full-length book, Highway of Sleeping Towns, won a Touchstone Distinguished Book Award from the Haiku Foundation. Congratulations, Debbie. I can, <laughs> I can only dream of doing that. I saw Debbie's presentation exaggerated perspective in haiku at the Haiku Society of America Zoom event earlier this year, and it made quite an impression on me. So much so that I chose perspective as one of our writing topics for 2021. I asked Debbie if she'd come along and do a presentation for us today, and I hope it's going to have the same inspirational effect on you as it had on me. Debbie, thank you so much for making the time to come and talk to us today. I'm very grateful to you. And now I'm just going to hand over to you and let you explain all about perspective in haiku. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for asking me to do this. I feel quite honored. Exaggerated perspective in haiku. Inspiration for your poetry P submission. I first became interested in exaggerated perspective when I read an essay by Hiroaki Sato, where he compared Issa to Hokusai, 
noticing the similarity in their use of exaggerated perspectives. As Sato notes, is there anyone who knows the name Hokusai and doesn't think of the painting of a great wave toppling over Mount Fuji? And this is from his book in Haiku. And here is, of course, the great wave that we all know, you know, with the giant wave, and you look at Mount Fuji, so small. And Isa, who, who lived at the same time, although their, I mean, their lifespans intersected, although it is unclear whether they ever met. There's no record of that. But he also uses exaggerated perspective in a lot of his haiku. Little snail, inch by inch, climb Mount Fuji. And here, Mount Fuji seems so much bigger from the perspective of a snail than if we're talking about two mountain climbers climbing Mount Fuji which I feel adds to the magnificence of, of the mountain. A single mosquito stirs up a wind near my ear. And here you don't just have the buzzing of the mosquito, you have a full blown wind at your ear. And again, here the exaggeration brings you to the sense of the actual moment that happened. Through a hole in the mosquito swarm, Kyoto. And this is very reminiscent of some of Hokusai's woodprints, like his Mount Fuji series, where you have Mount Fuji, you know, kites flying over Mount Fuji, and you have the great wave going over Mount Fuji. Here you have a little hole in a mosquito swarm, and then you see the big city of Kyoto. And I want to move two examples of contemporary English language haiku that use the same principle. Autumn mist, we taste our way through the orchard. I really love this because it's so evocative in so many ways. And you're not just eating one apple, we're eating the whole orchard. And I feel that you know, between that and the autumn mist, it just has a wonderful feeling. You know, if you said autumn mist, we taste our first, the first apple. I mean, that's kind of nice, but it doesn't have the same mystery and layers that this little bit of an exaggeration adds to it. Darkened village, the bats calls bouncing off the Milky Way. And the bat calls aren't actually bouncing off the Milky Way, but you get the sense of echoing and, and vastness by adding that little exaggeration. Slow hands, gently pruning a shape into sunset. This haiku, I mean, you're obviously not going to prune the sunset, but you get the sense of a hedge, and as you prune the hedge, you start to see the shape of the sunset behind it. And I just find that twist in the haiku really evocative. Sea anemones, I touch my finger to the setting sun. I don't know how many people have been down to tide pools and touched the sea anemone, but there's just something really beautiful about this. You know, that you're actually not touching the anemone, you're touching the sun. And the sea anemone kind of looks like you could imagine like a child's drawing of the sun. So it's really just wonderful. And here's one of mine, gray morning, the whole world of foghorn. Skyscrapers, the ant that is me beneath them. And this sort of evokes the same thing as the stale in Mount Fuji, where you have the skyscraper that seems so much larger when you start thinking of it as an ant and the ant that is me. It's sort of almost like a, it's a simile in a sense, but, but it's still an exaggeration. Beach dinner. The paw pod in her hand dwarfs the moon. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that pr 
properly, but it's a pot pot is a, a just shaped food from India that's made of flour. You know, just again, the, the this is reminiscent of all of the Hokusai prints where you have the moon that seems so small when you think of the piece of bread or the pot pot in your hand. Deep space, what we keep from our children, what they keep from us. Space images work really well with exaggerated perspective because deep space is so vast and so huge. And when you think about those secrets that we'd ever tell our kids or they don't tell us, and that widening gap between us, I, I feel that this has a really wonderful effect in this haiku. One by one, he hands over the spring winds, the balloon seller. I just love this one because you can see the balloon seller handing out balloons, but yet he's not handing just a balloon, he's handing you the spring wind. Again, this is just a beautiful way of looking at it. Globe street lamps, only one of them is the moon. Prior to making this presentation, I once did a workshop for the Southern California Hiker Study Group on exaggerated perspective, where we wrote them in the workshop. And Kathy Bella wrote this one, and that it was published at Keatsville Quarterly, and I just love it. I, you know, I can see the street in Pasadena where Kathy Bella lives, and I can see these globe street lamps, and then I see the moon, and they all look the same. 14,000 feet, the mountain disappears into my breathing. Yak Sukak Ishihara gave a presentation in Chicago in 1995 where he said, a haiku should present the truth as if it were fiction. He calls this introspective shaping, where he's shaping the scenery of the human mind to fit the poetic truth. So exaggerated perspective to get the deeper truth to what you're trying to see or feel and experience in the moment. Pulling light from the other world, the Milky Way. Again, this sort of exaggeration sort of conveys the truth in a way that the actual truth would it. And I'm going to end with this one, you know, again, an exaggeration, and you're telling the truth as if it were fiction. If only a dog could run free on the moon. Obviously, a dog can't run on the moon because there's no oxygen, but, but yet the sense of the emptiness of the moon and the vastness and with no fences and I think this gives the feeling of the truth of this. If it had been, if only a dog could run free in the neighborhood, it wouldn't say anything. But by saying run free on the moon, that exaggeration brings the truth home. It's your turn. Does this big or small thing remind you of something else? What feeling does it evoke in you? Or maybe you have a haiku that just isn't working, that it might work better and give a better truth if you added an exaggeration or hyperbole to it. And finally, quoting Ishihara, tell the truth as if it were fiction. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you very much. I'm inspired particularly by the, the snail. Can you remember the snail? I, I can't. I mean, it's something like inch by inch, the snail climbs Mount Fuji. But it, That's I the one, yeah. I'm really inspired to try and do something like that. And I'm so pleased you had the time. I know it was touch and go to get, get this recorded in time, but I thank you so much for coming along and being there and giving us that talk. People can listen to it on the podcast and they can also, I hope by the time the podcast is out, they will be able to look at the slides on YouTube as well. So they can go back and reread and, and really become inspired for our next topic, which will be perspective in haiku. So thank you very, very much, Debbie, for coming along today and doing this for us.
You're very welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, as you can imagine, when I have the opportunity to talk to fellow haiku enthusiasts, especially such experienced ones, the chat continues after the workshop. And I'm so pleased that I continued to record because there's a little bit of a bonus which you won't find on YouTube. But I wrote this poem, um, Red Planet Dust covers Beta Colony, the only green her eyes. Okay. Red Planet Dust covers Beta Colony, the only green her eyes. Nice. And, and why I wrote that, first of all, I have green eyes, which you probably can't tell um, <laughs> with the Zoom, but, but I have green eyes. And when I was a very little girl, like, I don't know, nine, 10, mm -hmm. my parents went on a car trip to Arkansas where my mother was from, my dad was from oh, Wisconsin, okay. my mom was from Arkansas. And we're somewhere in Oklahoma at a gas station and we're, my sister and I are cooped up in the back city of this Pontiac at this gas station. My dad's put gas in the car. We're looking outside and the ground is red. Okay. I get out of the car and just, I wanted to get out of the car. So I just got out and stood by the car as my dad was filling the tank. And I said to my, or maybe the, that was in the days when they were services. So all I remember is being outside the car at a oh. gas station with my dad. And I looked out at all this red dirt of Oklahoma. And I said, is this what Mars looked like? And my dad said, I don't know. I haven't been there yet. <laughs> and I remember this. This is this memory from my childhood. And everything was so red. And the only green was my so eyes. Nice. But if I wrote a poem that said, at a gas station, in Oklahoma, the only green her eyes, it doesn't have the same impact as being on Mars. No, and it's being, true. And being on Mars is actually the poetic truth of what really happened. Because as a little girl, I felt like I was on Mars. Because I was a little girl, I was sort of captive in the spaceship, the mothership, this car that was going to go <laughs> to Arkansas. And I had no choice the matter. I had to stay in the car or I could be out in the red dirt. But it was sort of like to my little childhood mind of being on Mars, right? I didn't know how to put that in uh, because I, I thought it might have went too far off the point of exaggeration. And I had to kind of hate talking about my own work. Debbie, I know what you mean. I'm never too comfortable talking about my work either. Thanks very much for sharing with us. Next up, I'd like to bring you the latest from our Renku, Golden Leaves Drifting. My thanks to all the poets who are working with me on this one. Scott Zylenga, Kim Russell, Reham L. Ashri, and Lorraine A. Padden. Please have a look at the show notes and find out exactly who wrote each verse. And remember, if you'd like to get involved and work in a collaboration, let me know by email. So, golden leaves drifting. Evening breeze, golden leaves drifting under street lights. Night creatures explore their new world. Through crumbling soil, ink caps and dead man's fingers mushrooming. Dry yellow corn stalks, black feathers watch over. Harvested fields, rinsed in moonlight, their cycle complete. Autumn snow, muffled sounds of morning. Sunlight, falling on fresh snow, the tips of orange leaves. A frosty fox licks the day into shape. White dappling the grey afternoon flurry. Head down following a stranger's footprints. Snowflakes swirl, a unique journey began by chance. Ideas in motion, the wind in the trees. Early blossom, yesterday's icicles break the silence. 
waxing moon, the rhythm of a slow thaw. Now, to conclude the podcast, I have a little treat for you. I don't know if you remember Series 3, Episode 20, We Met Nika, a.k.a. Jim Force. I told you at the time he had an interesting project, and today I'm delighted to say he's with us to tell us a little bit about it. Today I'd like to welcome Jim Force, a.k.a. Nika, to the podcast. Regular listeners will know that Nika was first published on the podcast in October 2020. For those of you who have not read about him in the Poets Directory on our website, I can tell you that he resides in Calgary, Alberta. That's in Canada. He's a member of Haiku Canada and the Haiku Society of America. He's been published widely and has a couple of chapbooks to his credit, which are Frogs Singing and snail my friend. When Jim first approached me with his submission, we got virtually chatting and he told me about one of his hobbies. It's a haiku related hobby and so I thought you might like to know about it too and possibly even join in. So I've invited him along to tell us a little bit about it. So Jim, tell us, what exactly is your hobby? Thank you Patricia. Well my hobby is creating haiku postcards. Now how this came about is I have some art friends who sent me art postcards during the pandemic. And you know, that was kind of exciting because I felt isolated and housebound and to get these cards in the mail. Uh, it's so much more exciting than getting things on uh, uh, the computer. So I thought, you know what I should do? I should make some haiku art cards or just haiku cards and send them out to friends and other uh, haiku poets. And part of my thinking is that it's important to share haiku. Haiku aren't meant just to be kept to yourself. They're to be shared. And unfortunately, I think um, mostly the people that read haiku journals are haiku poets. So I also thought I should get it out to some of my friends who don't read any poetry, but they would enjoy these cards. Now I add a little artwork to my cards and each card's kind of an original piece. But for the project, what I'm interested in is sharing um, haiku postcards. So I invite those who are interested to engage in this project is to connect with me through email. That email address will be in the show notes. And on the subject line, put haiku postcards and send me their mailing address. And I will get out a haiku postcard to them. And then what I would enjoy in return is that they send a haiku postcard to me. Now, those postcards can basically simply be a haiku on the front and with the address and stamp on the back. Um, I use 140 pound uh, watercolor paper for the cards but I'm sure there's all kinds of different ways you can make the cards or whatever you'd like and uh, I add a little bit of artwork I'm not an artist but they're little scribbles or whatever just uh, partly for my own entertainment but I think it adds a little bit so uh, I invite people to do whatever they would enjoy and I know some people have very beautiful calligraphy and as well as art stuff so make it what you please but also Keep it simple so you will actually do it. And then I invite you, once you've received the card and know how it feels, is to maybe send a few cards out to some friends that you know would enjoy them. So that's my hope. That's my uh, plan. And uh, another part, the last part, is that I think it'll help build community. I just was reading uh, Modern Haiku, and I realized there's like over 200 poets that have their work published in there, and I know hardly any of them. And I would like to get to know a few other poets, especially from around the world. I've met a few here in Canada and the US, but I'm looking forward to connecting with others around the world in this little project. And I hope that others will join me. Thank you, Patricia. Okay, so I have a couple of questions for you, Jim, just to, to make things clear. So you yourself do nice arty cards, but I'm thinking, 
would you be happy if people just bought a postcard or in my case I have a postcard app that I can take a picture and write a, um, a haiku on the back so are you happy with any type of, of postcard going out uh, in this project I'm happy with whatever people imagine I sort of have my simple little idea but so far I have received fridge magnets with a haiku on it I've received ones that are printed out that people have and give out as cards. I've even received a little chat book from someone. Oh. So I really leave it open. The idea is basically an exchange. So whatever you feel like doing, do it. So to go back to the idea of the exchange, when we first talked about it, I thought it was uh, people send you, their, send you an email and then you get talking to each other virtually and you find out each other's addresses so it was just a back and forth between you and the poet but are you saying that you'd like the poet to engage in your project not only to send you a postcard but maybe to send two or three others out to other poets and, and start spreading the word absolutely or even to non-poets just to okay. friends who might enjoy receiving a card and it puts a smile at that oh i got a card from somebody especially for me so it yeah, that's the bigger project. Okay, so, right. So let's start small then. So at the moment, yeah. we're going to just uh, communicate with you by email and you'll yeah. give us instructions what to do. Absolutely. Okay, good. And then my next question and possibly the last one is, are you looking for co-conspirators just from the American continent or are you happy to send postcards around the world? Around the world. I'd love to connect with people all around the world. I, that's haiku. Is a is now gone from Japan around the world and that's what I would like to connect with. Okay. Like you said, your email's going to be in the show notes and if people drop you a line saying they're interested in the, in the, interested in the project, then you will get back to them and give them instructions what the next step would be. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much, Jim. Thanks for adding yet another flavor to our haiku oh. community. That's really great. Well, thank you, Patricia, for all the work that you do in making this possible. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you, Jim. I think this project is more important than it would seem on the surface. I was recently at a British haiku event, Zoom, of course. It was a memorial for David Cobb, and there were a few people at the event who'd received postcards from David with one of his haiku written on them. They clearly treasured them. So I'm sending my inaugural postcard to Jim. But having had this chat with him, I went out and bought a number of postcards, which I'll send to my family and friends. I hope you'll join Jim in his project. There are details in the show notes on the Poetry P website. But even if you don't send postcards to Jim, maybe you'll follow his lead and send them to family and friends. So sadly, that's it for now. In a couple of weeks, I'll be reading your haiku and senryu on the topic of spring and autumn. The format for the podcast will be a little different. Come along and listen and tell me what you think. And before I go, just a reminder that I'm accepting submissions for humorous haiku and senryu until the 20th of January. Keep them coming. They can be belly laugh humorous or just raise a smile, ironic or filled with wordplay and puns. I'd just like some work that will bring a little lightness and brightness to our days. So until next time, keep writing. As usual, if there's something I've got wrong or I've missed something out, just email me and I'll put it right. Ciao!